Good evening, everyone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, our beautiful and fragile world is marred by the presence of war and strife, pollution and humanity stripping of natural habitat. At a global level, we ask for your guiding hand that amongst global leaders there might be influence to halt the damage we do to each other and to our beautiful world. In our nation, we lift to you our Queen, all political leaders, counsellors and support staff, all that support this country in its government. Whatever our politics or persuasion, we seek your guiding hand of peace, grace and mercy in search for the right way forward for our community and for our neighbourhoods. In uncertainty and turmoil, we pray that we might be the right kind of leaders who serve for the common good and not for our own personal gain. In our community, we seek uh, the best for those who have no place to call home, those who have no job in which they find satisfaction, and those who may go hungry this night. May we not rest until justices are righted and all have the good we know. We lift to you all who work in public service and especially the members of this council this night that we might know tonight your wisdom, peace and progress in the matters before us. And finally, we pray for ourselves that we might have the strength to negotiate personal bias, that we might have the health and strength to serve with the responsibility entrusted with excellence, that we might listen to one another with graciousness and speak with truth. Wisdom to know the right course of action and the courage to bring it to pass. Almighty God, we ask that you accept these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. May I have the apologies for absence, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have apologies from Councillors Burroughs, Cawthorn, Deer, Graham, Catra and Stead. And that was Councillor Jardus. Thank you. Um, item two on the agenda is the, to receive the minutes of the meeting of the Council held on the 7th of September 2017. Is everybody happy with those? Thank you. Are there any declarations of interest for tonight? Yes, Councillor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to declare a non-pecuniary interest as a member of the independent advisory group. Thank Thank you. Thank you. you. Sorry, which item, sorry, is that on? If I may, to be member, which Sorry. item was that on? But on which what, item is, on the which agenda? Item? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Can I please declare a non-pecuniary interest in item 8.4, being an honorary group captain of 601 Squadron, based at RAF Northold? Thank you. Are there any further? Declarations? No. Thank you very much. Come now to my announcements. Um, Well, I can hardly believe that I'm already six months into my mayoralty and the days and the weeks have just flown by. After the slowdown during the summer, the invitations started to build up again during September and we have been very busy over the last couple of months. It really amazes me how diverse all the events we attend can be. From visiting Harefield Hospital to see the new intensive care wards and the operating theatres, including displays of the heart valves, oxygen care systems, and interestingly, a pair of lungs 
breathing outside a body. Meeting the Uxbridge Street Angels to talk about their work with the homeless, joining a lovely lady celebrating our 100th birthday, judging cake and fancy dress competitions, and of course, raising a number of green flags within our green spaces across the borough. We've also attended a number of the wonderful Culture Bite events that our amazing library services have hosted over the last six weeks. I am sure that all the residents who attended really enjoyed these events. So in the last six months, we've attended 229 events, 29 of which were out of the borough, supporting a number of different mayors in their varied and interesting charity events. I would like to mention one event which I really enjoyed doing, and that was welcoming an iconic character back to the vinyl factory site, a huge 5.5 metre statue of Nipper, the HMV dog. I'm not sure whether he was too happy though, as when I removed the tarpaulin to unveil him, the heavens opened, and I'm sure he was wondering why I'd taken off his cover so that he could get wet. This site seems to be being developed very, very well, and I'm told that when all the building is finished, Nipper will have pied of place at its entrance with a gramophone and a speaker. It's a great piece of history that won't be lost. My second quiz night on the 30th of September went well, although we were down slightly on numbers due to a rather important meeting on the same night. It was, as, as usual, a fun evening with many interesting questions from Nicholas, and once again, there was a good battle for first place. Also, my charity event, a trip to the Battle of Britain bunker, with lunch at RAF North Holt, officers' mess, and a tour of RAF North Holt, was really well attended by a number of mayors across London and further afield. Everyone really enjoyed the day. My next quiz night, uh, charity quiz night, is to be held on the 29th of November. Hopefully there won't be another big meeting on the same night that there was last time. Please put the date in your diaries. I'd love to see you there, and maybe we can fill the Middlesex suite. All my charities are great causes, and I'd really like to raise a good amount to help them to continue their work. Also, we are delighted that Uxbridge College have agreed, again, agreed to the students again doing a murder mystery for my charity, with the drama students performing the murder play and the catering students preparing the meal. They are all very excited to be doing it. We're hoping for the 1st of March for the date, but that is still to be confirmed. And I hope we can have a good attendance on that one too. So that's the end of my announcements. Uh, so we go on to uh, item five, which is a public question. Unfortunately, the gentleman, Mr. Chris Walters, cannot be here to ask his question this evening, so I will announce it. Would the council leader be willing to adopt a better approach to putting residents first by way of implementing a less formal system of interaction between the residents and those making the decisions within the council, which will allow the residents to table concerns in a more social environment. Councillor Buddyford. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Mr Waters, for your question. I will answer it because Mr Waters has said he will watch it on YouTube, even though he's not present. The term social environment, as well as referring to the immediate physical and social setting in which people live, also includes interaction in person or through communication media. Since I became leader of the council in July 2000, I've seen a number of changes in the communication process, which, with the use of email giving residents immediate access to the council or council members. I'm pleased to report that resident interaction with Hillingdon's democratic process is at an all-time high. This is not only through formal means, such as by submitting a petition, but increasingly in more social ways, through, for example, watching our meetings online. I am aware that you, Mr Waters, watched a council meeting online in January when you submitted a previous public question. Two years ago, you would not have been able to do this, 
and tonight your question and my response to it is being streamed live across the borough and beyond. Last year, nearly 26,000 people viewed our planning, cabinet licensing and full, cabinet, full council meetings on YouTube. This is a giant leap in the number of residents able to see how decisions are made in Hillingdon, and also in a way that is directly accessible to them through their phones, computers, TVs or even Xboxes. Our broadcasts are relevant to residents. For example, over 500 people tuned in to watch a licence application for the new Cineworld at South Ryslip. Concerns raised by residents were actively taken forward by ward councillors who directly presented the case to the subcommittee before they made a decision and imposed conditions on the cinema complex to safeguard residents. Similarly, thousands tune in to see planning committee decisions that directly affect their street and neighbourhood. Those watching can gain a great insight into how councillors carefully weigh up the different views and information before them and make a final fair and balanced decision. We want to be as open as possible to residents. However, the laws around decision making understandably require some element of procedure in terms of interaction. As is often said, we hold meetings in public, not public meetings. If the latter were the case, it would be very difficult to make decisions get anything done for residents. It has to be a balance and in Hillingdon we have got that just right. Where we do hold meetings, our petitions process established in 2002 has provided a very effective route for such engagement. Highly valued, it is even more popular today than when it started. Last year we received over 113 petitions about <coughs> council services and 130 directly relating to planning applications. Within these petitions are thousands of residents' signatures where they have taken the time and trouble to add their name to a local cause they believe in and engage in local democracy. With planning applications, petitioners get the opportunity to address the committee directly before a decision is made. This is usually within a matter of weeks. More complex petitions about council services tend to come forward to a petition hearing in a few months. Where possible, we endeavour to progress simpler petitions before they get to a petition hearing. This saves time and ensures that where, where we are responsive and as possible to residents' wishes as early as possible. Ultimately, our pet petition process, whilst universal by design, is flexible, responsive and personalised. We take each petition on a case-by-case -case basis. Feedback from residents since 2014 shows over 86% satisfaction with the way they engage with our democratic process. Whilst myself and my Cabinet colleagues regularly meet informally with residents and local organisations to listen to their views, the cornerstone of our democracy is your local representatives, your ward councillors. From my own experience, ward councillors in Hillingdon play a vital role putting forward residents' interests directly to Cabinet members and we always seek to take these into account when we make decisions. Synonymous with good decision making is strong accountability. Here in Hillingdon, we have made effective cabinet governance and leadership a central feature in how we operate, so Hillingdon residents know who is responsible at the political elected level. Your question mentions putting residents first, and this is one of the four principles that this administration operates on, the others being our heritage, our environment and sound financial management, and to a large degree they are all linked. Putting residents first includes maintaining their libraries and leisure centres, having the best parks and open spaces in the UK, investing in new schools and road maintenance, maintaining weekly waste and recycling collections and providing a level of support to our older residents, far exceeding that provided by other local authorities. Promoting activities such as the Older People's Assembly, the Youth Council, the Children in Care Council and the Carers Forum. We defend our residents against inappropriate developments such as HS2 and the Heathrow expansion plans. At a local level to you, we successfully oppose the Power Day site plans, and, and this is to Mr Waters, I'm addressing this, and believe me, if there was any truth at all in the scaremongering rumours about expanding Northolt Airport being put about by an unidentified but well-funded group, similar to Back Heathrow, we should be leading the fight against that. And as we've done with both HS2 and the Heathrow project, funding the residents' groups, running the campaigns against these proposals. In fact, Madam Mayor, in the interest of openness and honesty, I think tonight we need to put out a challenge to those funding the, and running the Stop Norfolk campaign to either put up or shut up. By the end of this month, I would ask them to send to me the names and addresses of all involved in managing that campaign and a list of all the expenditure incurred to date with details of who is providing the funding and the amounts provided to date. Yeah. 
We will publish this request and the details of the responses in the next edition of Hillingdon People and allow residents to judge for themselves the validity and purpose of this organisation. I will also report the response or lack of it back to the next council meeting. One just needs to look around the borough to see this administration's many achievements working side by side with residents. It demonstrates that we really do live up to our vision of putting residents first. So, in a nutshell, Mr Waters, whilst we have interaction with residents, which is essential to the decision-making process, for us it is as much about delivering services and facilities as the process of council functions. And ultimately, the residents decide if we're getting that right at local elections. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Polyford. Item 6, the report of the Head of Democratic Services. Thank you, Madam Mayor. If I may, just before we call on the Leader of the Council, uh, draw members' attention to uh, item little 2 at the top of page 2, recommendations A and B, which are altered from those that were published on page 12 of the actual agenda. This is to reflect the fact that the Audit Committee have made a recommendation for the appointment of an independent chairman, but that is subject to the receipt of satisfactory references. So the items are recommending delegating the appointment to myself in consultation with the Leader of the Council and the Leader of the Labour Group, but it will reflect the recommendation of the Audit Committee. Councillor Puddyford. Thank you, Madam Mayor. There are three recommendations contained within this report. The first is for noting and the second and third for decision by Council. The first item refers to the urgent implementation of decisions since the last Council meeting on the 7th of September as detailed in the agenda. The second refers to the appointment of a new independent audit chairman following the interviews held earlier this week <coughs> and the change of membership on the Residents and Environmental Services Policy Overview Committee. The third relates to proposed changes to the operation of the Pensions Board to bring this more in line with those used by other Councils across London. Madam Mayor, I formally move the three recommendations on block. Thank you. Is that seconded? Madam Mayor, I formally second and reserve my right. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Shall we take a vote? Is that agreed? Thank you. Item 7, we have um, questions from members. Item 7 1. Uh, uh, questions submitted by Councillor Lavery to the Cabinet Member for Education and Children's Services, Councillor Simmons. Councillor Lavery. Uh, Madam Mayor, if I can ask question 7.1 as per the order paper. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Lavery, for the interest you continue to show in making sure that our younger residents of the borough are put first when it comes to getting a school place of their choice. Um, to provide a bit of context before I give the statistics, last year there was a 2% increase in the number of school place applications across London. Uh, Hillingdon participates in a pan-London process, not least because many of our residents may live close to borough boundaries where they're applying to schools that may be in another borough. But Hillingdon experienced a 3% increase, so we're above the London average, and that reflects many years of growth in the number of children who are resident in the borough. And despite that increase, uh, to a record high of 3,416 applications in total for secondary school places, we remain as one of the top boroughs both in London and in our local area, West London, for allocating school places at a school of choice. And to give an example of what that means in the context of London, on National Offer Day, 7% of children across London as a whole did not receive an offer of any school place in response to the application that they made. And in Hillingdon, 100% of applicants were offered a school place on Offer Day. <coughs> in terms of percentages, 94.9% of Hillingdon pupils received one of their preferred choices on Offer Day. And of those, 67.4% were allocated their first choice of secondary school within the borough. I think it is very important to recognise that not all parents will put the number one choice that they hope their child will go to as the number one on the application form because all applications are treated equally in the way that uh, preferences are allocated. 
and that means that the first choice places are not the only important consideration and therefore it is a very important consideration what percentage also receive one of their top choices and that's why I think the fact that we've got as far as 94.9% receiving one of their preferred choices uh, reflects that we are seeking to make sure that every Hillingdon child gets a choice of a good school place within the borough. Thank you. Uh, have, is there a supplementary? Uh, Madam Mayor, there is. Um, can the Cabinet member outline what steps the Council is taking <coughs> to ensure that there are sufficient spaces in secondary schools, especially given the developing pressure in the north of the borough where there has been historically less spare capacity. Well, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lavery, for your question, which highlights a very important aspect of the planning for secondary school places within the borough, which is uh, the north-south divide. And that north-south divide, when it comes to secondary places, is the opposite of the north-south divide that we've had historically with primary school places. And members of this council who've been around a little while will recall that when the previous Labour government wanted to rebuild and refurbish every secondary school in the land, one of the expectations they set out for Hillingdon's participation was that we would close at least one secondary school in the south of the borough because they regarded us as having far too much capacity. Now clearly there has been significant growth in terms of both housing development and people moving into existing homes and people having children within the south of the borough. But the historically less capacity, lower level of capacity in secondary schools in the north means that the demand there is becoming more acute sooner uh, than is the case uh, south of the A40. So the measures the council has been taking include uh, the investment in Abbotsfield School in Hillingdon, uh, just over uh, £30 million to rebuild the school uh, to provide a higher standard learning environment but also an additional 75 places in each year group becoming a co-educational school to ensure it offers places to a wider range of children we've then seen the uh, construction of the new Northwood Secondary School which provides a total of 1,080 places in the very north of the borough and that includes an expansion over the previous capacity that was there to provide an additional form of entry i.e. an additional 30 places in each year group as the school grows and fills up as time goes by. That, uh, Madam Mayor, covers those parts of the expansion programme for mainstream secondary schools which are within uh, the, the control directly of the council. But turning to the future, uh, there are a number of pieces of work underway, including the expansion of areas, uh, schools in areas of very high demand, such as Viner's School in Ickenham Ward, because it's very clear from the levels of applications that around the Ickenham West Ryslip area there is particularly acute pressure on school places and that will help to meet that demand. Uh, where we are finding more of a challenge is within that area of new school places which is under the direct control of central government. We have two bids to open a new sixth form of entry secondary school in the north of the borough. Uh, one from the Church of England uh, Academy uh, known as the Bishop Arden School Proposal and the second one from a consortium of local Hellingdon schools uh, known as the Hellingdon High Proposal. Uh, despite a good deal of urging, we've yet to have any approach from the <coughs> Education and Skills Funding Agency to discuss uh, the location of such a school, although I understand there are a number of sites which are being looked at. But what we do anticipate is that the work which is underway directly under the control of the council will deliver a significant number of additional places uh, in the coming years so that all of our residents can be assured of that. And just finally, I know Councillor Lavery and other members have expressed a good deal of interest in provision for children with special educational needs and disabilities. This is something which Hillingdon has had a particularly good track record on and was recently highlighted by Ofsted and the Care Quality Commission when they inspected our local arrangements. But one of the things that has been a noticeable development is the number of children with special educational needs and disabilities seeking places in mainstream schools in the borough in addition to those who are going to the special schools that we have. And that is one of the reasons, for example, why as part of the expansion at Viner School, uh, capacity for children with hearing impairments has been funded by the council to ensure that they continue to enjoy access to a good quality education, the same as their peers. 
I hope those points reassure Councillor Lavery that work is in hand to make sure that every child gets a good quality school place and clearly we will continue to put pressure on the government to ensure that the additional programmes are delivered on time and on budget in the way that the ones under the control of Hillingdon have been delivered. We move on now to uh, question 7-2, uh, submitted by Councillor Gardner to the Leader of the Councillor, Council, Councillor Puddyford. Councillor Gardner. In addition to the recommendations of the Social Services, Housing and Public Health Pops Review into Housing Benefit, and with specific regard to Universal Credit, can the Leader of the Council please work with the job centres to minimise any rent arrears our residents may incur? We could do this by the council offices working with the Job Centre Plus staff to encourage the vulnerable residents to pay their rent direct to the landlords. Councillor Paddyford. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Gardner, for your question. The Government's Universal Credit Programme was intended to create a simplified benefit system by consolidating benefits into one monthly payment so that it was more understandable as a household income and giving claimants more incentive to work. There are, however, some challenges with the introduction of a new benefit payment system. It is recognised that not everybody claiming benefits will be skilled in managing their own money, nor will many households have the necessary savings to help cushion the move from weekly or fortnightly benefit payments to a monthly arrangement. As a consequence, there is a risk that some claimants will fall behind with their housing rent payments. The Council has been working closely with the Job Centre Plus for several years in the run-up to Universal Credit being rolled out fully in Hillingdon from July 2018, to ensure that the transition is as smooth as possible for our residents to avoid arrears. This includes providing coordinated advice and support to residents to secure and sustain paid employment to reduce their reliance on benefits. Joint working with the Job Centre Plus business partner to implement a programme of communications and support to ensure that our residents receive regular and timely information about the forthcoming changes and advice and support about moving to universal credit. An established housing support team that covers all tenures to mitigate the risk of tenancy failure, including rent arrears arising from the welfare reform. The team provides targeted practical advice, assistance and support to residents. Coordinated joined up working across the Council to plan for a rollout of the changes. This includes joint working with the homeless prevention team, social care and the revenues and benefits team in the Council. Identifying vulnerable residents who would be eligible to apply for the housing element of their benefit to be paid direct to their landlord. Improving IT systems and introducing new ways of working to identify those council tenants most at risk of rent arrears based on a range of information to proactively support them with advice and assistance. This includes new tenants at the tenancy sign-up stage, joint working with other partner agencies that are able to provide practical advice and advocacy to residents about household budget and debt management, claims for benefit and making payments. Councillor Gardner, you have a valid concern and I thank you for raising it, but I do believe that the staff of this council are doing all they can to assist those residents moving to the Universal Credit Scheme, including working with Job Centre Plus, as you suggest. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Payford. Councillor Gardner, do you have a second supplementary? I do indeed. Um, thank you. Would the council actually consider producing, maybe producing a leaflet which would go into Hillington people um, which could spell out in detail where residents can get help to manage their budgets and emphasise the dangers of eviction if residents fall into rent arrears. We could ask the Job Centre Plus staff to hand that out and we could also get the RSLs to get their tenants involved so that the RSLs are aware of the dangers. Please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That, that's um, an excellent idea, Councillor Gardner. There, there are some leaflets already uh, put about. I don't think it's, um, it's worth putting it in England people. I think we produce a leaflet that's handed out to the, each case on a case-by-case -case basis um, by either us or various other agencies, but I'll certainly look into it and make sure that's done. Good idea. <coughs> Thank you. Um, we now move on to item 8 on the agenda, motions. Uh, item 8.1, a motion from Councillor Riley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, recently, the Chief Executive responded on behalf of the Council to the Mayor's Office for Policing and Crime consultation paper regarding their intentions for the Metropolitan Police Service 
entitled Public Access Engagement Strategy Consultation. I think the expression consultation may have been a little forward given what we were told later. The uh, Police and MOPAC held a series of public events at which the borough commander gave a presentation, the most recent of which was on the 13th of September, held in this very chamber and was by all accounts the most well attended uh, in those many across London. The next evening, the borough commander uh, came before the External Services uh, Scrutiny Committee and was closely questioned by the committee on the MOPAC policy concerning the sale or other disposal of police buildings and more widely the access to uh, the police by the residents of this borough. Madam Mayor, the public meeting and its attendance was to the very great credit of the people of this borough and showed the deep interest that the residents of this borough have in policing and in this aspect of it in particular. Many issues were raised at the uh, meeting, many questions were asked and a number of councillors were present and most of us asked questions of the MOPAC representative who was very happy to let our borough commander take the flak for this Labour Mayor's ill-considered and very poor proposals. Can I tell the Chamber that the MOPAC representative can have been in little doubt as to the depth of feeling of that meeting relating to this whole consultation and its consequence. Madam Mayor, one of the primary functions of political leadership at all levels, and especially at the city and capital city level, is to ensure the civic safety of the residents, providing the very best policing service that there can be. Part of that political and civic communal covenant, bearing in mind that we as residents of this borough pay in different ways for our policing, is to do this in the most effective and efficient way and within budgetary constraints of the time. Mayor Sadiq Khan is not doing that. He is exercising a sort of can't-do attitude, if you will. The Mayor's answer to policing in in Hillingdon in 2017 is to make it less accessible, less well geographically focused, and to employ a wholly unintelligible approach, which he has foisted onto the police force of the metropolis and made them take up as if it were their own. And this is a very poor approach. The Mayor of London receives a considerable grant or payment from central government, our money in different forms, It is then his primary duty to deploy those resources in the best way possible and not to abandon the people of this borough or isolate them or compromise their safety by complaining about the size of the grant and then blaming national government, but to look for savings in imaginative ways and find innovative innovative ways of uh, deploying policing in this borough, taking into account the various geographical, demographic and other features. In the same financial climate, Madam Mayor, this administration has made savings of £120 million over the last 10 years and kept frontline services and more for residents. Any sensible review needed to look at working practices, real access, coverage, uh, deployment, setting costs against costs, looking to the wider application of policing. This process ought to have been a great opportunity for reviewing policing in London and in our borough, but instead, MOPAC's answer is a caving in of service and coverage perpetuated by a Mayor who is incapable of creative financial and operational application. Madam Mayor, the idea that this, in this borough the Mayor closes all but the police station in Hayes is a nonsense. It's a service provision nonsense, a nonsense in terms of building, a resources and engagement nonsense, meaning that it is quicker for many residents to travel to New Scotland Yard than it is to go from their home to Hayes. Madam Mayor, no account has been taken of the nature of the transport links between North and South and vice versa. No account has been given to the additional traffic and other burdens to be caused by HS2, which will impact on police responses. No account has been given to response times when officers are based in Hayes. And highlighted by councillors on the uh, External Services Scrutiny Committee, no proper account has been taken as to cost-benefit analysis in closing Uxbridge, Ryslip and Northwood police stations and having a complete major redevelopment of Hayes, which at that public meeting many residents from Hayes said was uh, impossible and impractical. Madam Mayor, let this council, by this motion, send a message to Mayor Khan. Do not sacrifice this borough's safety on the altar of political posturing. Reverse this cerebrally bankrupt policy. Put our residents first. I move this motion. Do we have a seconder for the motion? Madam Mayor, I happily second um, the motion and reserve my right. Thank you. Councillor Curling, you wish to speak. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, In moving this amendment, I don't want to detract from the serious issues at hand and the fact that we should have the safety and security of our residents at the forefront of our debate. 
but I cannot sit idly by while the party opposite attempt to make this a party political campaign in their desperate efforts to cling on to control of the borough at the local elections in May. I would therefore like to put the record straight as far as cuts to the police service are concerned. It may well have escaped their notice that from 2008 to 2016, the Mayor of London was Boris Johnson, and many of the cuts underway were initiated under his watch. He inherited a well-funded and well-resourced police service from the outgoing Mayor, who had created the ward-based teams of a sergeant, two PCs and three PCSOs in every ward across London. Mayor Johnson, <coughs> seeing the cost of everything but the value of nothing, decided he could save money by selling off expensive, expensive buildings, and so he ploughed on with his plans to sell all sorts of property that was owned by the Met. The big sell-off started around 2010 and continued up until 2016, his last year in office. A notable local sell-off during that time was West Straiton Police Station. Mayor Johnson also sold off New Scotland Yard and downsized the Metropolitan Police Service um, not only in terms of its property but also its, in terms of its numbers of officers and the number and makeup of community neighbourhood policing. In a desperate effort to cling on to power at uh, City Hall, Mayor Johnson also made cuts to the police service budget in order to cut the council tax precept by a matter of a few pennies for the average council tax payer. So now that the political narrative has been balanced, we have seen a, million, a billion pound cuts from our police service in the last seven years. Perhaps we can all agree that this level of government cut is not in the interest of the residents we have pledged to put first. The government have also pr uh, proved that they can find the odd billion here or there where they need it for their own strength and stability, so there's no excuse why they can't find, they can't find it to secure, the uh, to secure our police service. So let's be clear, it's the drastic nature of the cuts by central government that has put the Mayor of London in this position, needing to take such uh, drastic actions, and these government cuts are not just restricted to London, Indeed, after the terrorist attack in Manchester earlier this year, a video clip of Theresa May being told by a senior police officer that the government cuts to neighbourhood policing is putting people's lives at risk went viral. Madam Mayor, I would urge all members of this council to truly put the residents first by supporting this amendment so it is clear to okay. everyone that this council really does put uh, its close, residents please? first rather than a political scrap. Madam Mayor, I urge people to support the, the amendment. Amen. Madam Mayor, could I just confirm with Councillor Curling that you're moving the amendment as set out on here because you didn't actually specify what the amendment was. Do we have a seconder for the amendment? Yeah, Madam Mayor, thank you. Um, I wish I had Councillor Riley's speech because I would have changed uh, the words from Khan to Johnson really and it would have been the same speech but Madam Mayor whichever side of this chamber we sit on and whatever our political persuasion the well-being and safety of our residents is the reason why we enter into such debates as Councillor Riley has mentioned in his motion the Council acknowledges the reduction in funding from central government but I feel, I feel that he falls short of criticising the failure of the government and highlighting the strategy of the previous Mayor in March 2013, Boris Johnson and Sir Bernard Hogan Howe launched a vision. I'll quote some of it. City Hall says the plan, which was the subject of public consultation, would see more officers on the streets, but at the cost of axing front counters and abolishing local specialist crime units. Reductions in City Hall and central government funding mean the Met has to save over 500 million over the next three years. The force is responding to the challenge by cutting the amount it spends on buildings and reducing the number of officers who hold rank of sergeant and above. Every borough will retain at least one 24-7 front counter, but across London, almost half will be closed. Now, Boris Johnson had originally promised that no front counter would be closed without equivalent or superior facilities being opened. That promise was removed from the final version of that plan and replaced by contact points, which operate for shorter hours, sometimes just three hours a week. Currently, now, today, the NPS operational leaders have been clear in their, 
in that the closure of a station does not mean the withdrawal of policing from a community. Rather, it means the support officers number numbers as much as possible at the time of real pressure on policing. The Mayor, Sadiq, Sadiq Khan, is also doubling the number of dedicated ward officers to ensure that there are two in every ward by the end of the year. These officers will be located closer to the communities and running new community contact sessions every week and in every ward. With a plan to improve the MPS tele telephone service, which accounts for 70% of the crime reporting in London, and a strategy to improve online, on, online offer where a crime can be reported so you don't have to visit in person, it surely has to be seen as a way of being efficient and avoiding those unnecessarily awful costs that being forced on the police. It's a plan comparable in theory to the ones here at the Council that have created operating efficiencies, but sadly have led to the closure of day centres. Lengthier waiting times when you're on the phone in the planning service, and depending on the outcome of the review on the children's centres, we may see a few closures there. One has to agree with Councillor Curling's motion. Our residents will be better served by enlisting three MPs to lobby central government in their failure to provide proper, appropriate funds to fight the crimes on our streets. Thank you. Madam Mayor, if I could just clarify, uh, Councillor Dillon has just seconded uh, an amendment to the original motion and we are now debating the amended motion as shown in italics at the bottom of page four. Those members who indicated to speak on the original motion, which would be Councillors Yarrow, Crow and Councillor Mills who reserved his right, if you wish to speak on the amendment you'll need to indicate it again. So far on the amendment I have Councillors Sweeting and Morse. Councillor Sweeting, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I speak in support of the amendment and against the motion submitted by Councillor Riley. The core of the problem facing policing in London should not be directed to the Labour Mayor of London. The problem squarely comes from the lack of money provided by a Conservative government to deliver a police service which is able to keep the people of London and its many visitors safe. This view is supported by Cressida Dix. Met Commissioner. In a year which has seen many terrorist attacks on London, we have a Conservative Government which has seen fit to deliver a package of cuts to the Met Police budget totalling £1 billion, which will mean that police numbers in London are now likely to fall to a 19-year low. I can quite understand this Conservative Council's reticence in not directing <coughs> the blame where blame clearly rests, and being very economic with the truth by using the Labour Mayor of London as a convenient scapegoat. However, the evidence is there for all informed people to see for themselves. We have a Mayor of London protecting the capital's population in the best way he can under overwhelming financial obstacles put there by the current Conservative government. So let's be quite clear about this. Managing or not managing the finance of a London borough cannot in any way be compared, as Councillor Riley has done, to managing the budget for policing in one of the world's most prestigious cities. It is just this Council's way of trying to shift the blame away from their own party's inadequacies and on to Labour so close to the borough elections next year. The Mayor of London has sought to keep the people of London safe by trying in every way he can to protect frontline policing and police numbers. However, he has had two hands tied behind his back and can only do his best for the people of London by pleading with a Conservative government to think again and fund policing in our capital city in a way which will indeed put the safety of all of its residents and visitors first. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Sweeting. Councillor Moore, you indicated. Um, I am speaking for the amendment. In the past last four years, the Metropolitan Police also had to cut, make 600 million of savings and an additional 400, which I will address in a minute, the extra 400. Meanwhile, the number of recorded offences increased with violent crime rising 63% since May 2013, and gun crime, which the previous mayor cut, the resources for that, has actually gone up 54% in the last two years. 
The various projections predict police numbers in London call pool to one officer per 326 Londoners, a 26% decrease since 2010, a very significant effect, which I personally have sometimes suffered from. Um, and I will quote Deputy Assistant Commissioner Mark Simmons, we need our office to be focused on serious crime cases where there is a realistic chance that we'll be able to solve it. I presume by that some crimes are now listed as not, not being investigated because they're not enough value. If we do face a scenario of 27,500 officers in 2000, we have to reduce or stop some investigations. So we would have to reduce. If you look at the projected 400 million, a large part of this is spending on firearms, uh, some of it is paying pensions and modern IT support. There are the real pressures facing the current mayor. The police are having to prioritise personal safety due to the unpredictable attacks that we have witnessed. So the police will need systems for increasing monitoring of potential terrorist communications to prevent attacks. They may have to work out recognition systems, face recognition systems, the magic person face with, to support their alter or preventative measures. This is a more difficult world for the police to work in and they need our support. The motion as, as presented, the, the, the original motion uh, is basically um, inappropriate. And what you effectively got is this councillor is attempting to say that uh, the, the current mayor is responsible when it's very clear that historical process, the original cutting of the police stations was shot by the former mayor. And you don't have to face up to the fact that the Conservative Party are the principal problems. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Mills. Councillor Mills. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm going to uh, actually welcome this amendment uh, from, from the Labour Group, but I'm also very disappointed about this amendment. And I'm going to welcome it because it clearly demonstrates the big difference between this side of the chamber and that side of the chamber and how we view this important issue. Because not once tonight have we heard from them about any of the concerns that residents in this borough actually have about these proposals. The proposal to make Hayes the only counter. The difficulty that would have of moving people to, from various parts of the borough to get there and indeed as my colleague said for some residents in parts of the borough it will be easier for them to go to Scotland Yard than to go by public transport to Hayes. It makes no reference to the actual physical problems that would appear around Morgan's Lane and, and Uxbridge Road of having more people descending upon Hayes Police Station which is already at full stretch and would in need of investment in itself. It makes no comment from the Labour Party about how we deal with the issues of ensuring that there is a response across the length of the borough as wide and as narrow, as, as long and as narrow as, as Hillingdon. And that's what I'm concerned about, because what the Conservative response was about was trying to make sure that residents' concerns were contained in that report. And just for the accurate record, when Mr Johnson was Mayor of London and he made some savings, he recognised that in closing West Drayton, there was no way that he could close all police stations in Hillenden because of the very need for people to be able to access a police station from the north in the middle and the south of the borough. And that's why we've still got Ryslip, Uxbridge and Hayes police stations. And I think that's a point that you need to take on board. But what this motion is really, this amendment is really demonstrating is an inability of the Labour group to understand what putting residents first is really about. And I have to say to you, and others will be the judge of this, but you are the ones who are actually making the politics out of this and putting politics first. You are the ones that are saying, well, if we don't get enough money, cuts will have to be the, the answer. So that is a clear message. It's not residents first with you, it's residents last with you. And then finally, of course, the consequence is, well, if there's going to be more money, we have to get it raised and we have to put everyone's taxes up. And, of course, we know you have a great desire to want to increase the council tax in this borough if you get a chance. Can I suggest, Madam Mayor, and I'm assuming, and I'm trying to be as fair-minded as I always am on these matters, 
I'm, I'm assuming that Councillor Curlin actually put in a submission to the consultation. Can, you can he, can he, bring, please, bring it to can he please submit that Councilor by 11 Mills. o'clock tonight? Please or has he not actually end. submitted on behalf of the residents? Councillor Nelson. My apologies. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Mayor. If I can remember correctly, this Prime Minister, who was then the Home Secretary, introduced a massive cut that is now being felt by the Metropolitan Police since 2010. And may I also remind the members on the other side that the, Metropo that the MP for Oxbridge, Mr. Johnson, who was the Mayor, have pushed through these cuts with the Home Secretary, the Prime Minister, Mrs. Mrs. May. Since 2010, the Met budget has been reduced by 600 million, and a further 400 million of savings has to be founded by 2021. Yet the opportunity to generate more income or make substantial savings are diminishing as the Met Police Force has force is cut to the bones. And unless this government funds cut stops, officers, may make, officers' numbers could fall below 27,500 by 2021, a 19 year low. Our residents who will no longer have a police station in their locality that they can rely upon to use will no longer be able be available due to the, 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 due to the cuts. Let's not forget where this all started. It started by this story government and its impact on all of us because sometimes in our lives we will have to call on the police service for help and they will not be able to attend to, to, due to this government's cut. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nelson. Councillor Allen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Having sat here and listened to Councillor Riley, one could be forgiven for believing we are living in Never Never Land Council. No mention of the children's centre cuts or the elder centre. No, no, no. You told us those buildings weren't important. People Point of weren't. order. Speak to the Mayor, please. Madam Mayor. The Leader of the Council told us those buildings weren't important, it was where they could place children, and that's what he told us at the time. Now, let's move on to dear old Boris. Boris, who cut 20,000 staff instead of cutting buildings, instead of going to his government and saying, look, we yes, can't Councilor do this. Um, through the chair, please. I, I am doing it, so I apologise. Just like Council Mills and the others waving their hands this way, I do the same. Sadiq Khan is not willing to do that. He's saying buildings might be important. He agrees with the old political on that. It's people. And that's why he wants to put more people on the beat, more police on the beat to save people's lives. Our amendment can make a difference if only this administration has got the courage to put politics aside and join with us to go along. I move. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Councillor Simmons, you indicated. Well, Madam Mayor, I'm very conscious that we have a lot of residents in the chamber tonight and watching online who are clearly very keen to see what are their elected representatives actually doing about this issue. And what Councillor Mills and Councillor Wiley have clearly said is that as an administration, we have put forward our submission to the consultation to say, this is what we think should happen. We are concerned on behalf of our residents about access to front counter and other policing services in this borough. And speaking as someone who's been burgled recently, I understand how important it is, in a very personal way, to be able to get a good response from officers who understand the local environment, the local circumstances, and who can attend in good time. And the submission this administration has put in seeks to do that on behalf of our residents. 
So this motion is about this council's commitment to saying, here is a solution, here is a way forward to serve the interests of the people who live in this borough. I'm concerned that what I've heard is a diversion into politics and blame. An amendment that focuses on, should the mayor, who is making these decisions, be taking a begging bowl to central government and asking for more money at a time when we all know and recognise the country's finances are not in a great state and we're not going to debate, I'm sure, who is to blame for that situation this evening. But we've demonstrated in this borough at a time when central government has reduced our funding by more than 50%, that by working smarter, by working more efficiently, we can keep services open, we can invest in the things that matter to our residents. We've seen the ability of the Greater London Authority, the Mayor, over many years to do the same when so minded. And it seems to me a pretty cheap shot for a new Mayor to come along and say, let me close four-fifths of the police stations that serve Hillingdon residents and blame it on central government, when that Mayor could apply the same principles to the way that the Metropolitan Police Service is run, to prioritise the things that are in the interest of residents and make that money go further. And I think the residents who are here tonight hopefully will consult the submission of this administration saying how we think that should be achieved and we'll go and have a look and see what Councillor Curling and the Labour Group had to say about what their solution was and when they can put those two things and hopefully there are two things Councillor Curling together and compare them they will make a decision about who it is that is standing up as elected representatives for their interest in this debate. Thank you Councillor Simmons. Are there any other speakers? Anyone else wish to speak? No. Councillor Riley. Thank you, Madam. If there are no other speakers, we go back to Councillor Riley as the mover of the original yes. amendment. You have a right of reply on this debate. If you don't wish to speak, then we go back to Councillor Curling as the mover of the amendment. He has a right of reply. You have a right of reply. Thank you. I don't wish to speak to the amendment. No. No, not. Councillor Curling. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, if, if you look at the Green Papers and actually read the two motions, the, uh, the original motion and the amended motion, um, I don't think there's any doubt as to which one is trying to politicise it and which one is trying to depoliticise the issue. Um, what, what's happened in the past is a matter of record. In fact, the, the TV report yesterday uh, on the BBC Local News actually said this started under Boris Johnson. So we can't just go back and rewrite history. Um, I, would, I would read out the, uh, the final paragraph of the motion uh, or the amendment um, that I put forward. And it says, Council agrees that the administration should enlist the support of the three borough MPs to assist the Mayor of London in lobbying central government for the appropriate funding for a police service that has sufficient resources for the long-term protection of our residents. Um, the three borough MPs, there are two Conservative and one Labour, uh, a, a Labour Mayor of London, um, that's hardly um, politicising the issue, it's trying to pull people together. Um, this amendment was brought to Council to allow us to bring together the borough's elected representatives across the board in order to lobby central government for the funding necessary to protect the safety and security of our residents. So I will leave it to those in the audience, those that can read the, um, the, 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 yellow, uh, the, sorry, the green papers and those that have watched the debate on, on YouTube to see which side of the chamber is trying to politicise and which is trying to pull us together. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Curling. We now come to the vote on the amendment. Those in favour? Those against? The amendment is lost. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That amendment falls. We now return to the uh, original debate on the original motion from Councillor Riley, of which we currently have three speakers indicated, four now. Councillor Yarrow, Crow, Councillor Mills, who reserves his right, and now Councillor Dillon. So, Councillor Yarrow. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Well, 
At the MOPAC meeting, uh, it proved to be an extremely tough time for the police. They had had 11 previous meetings, quite clearly in smaller boroughs, and they had perceived no real problems. But lo and behold, they came to Hillingdon and got the answer they didn't want, which was total opposition from the residents. Now, I have to say that the councillors who were present at that meeting held back their views until the residents had had their say, so that the matter could be resolved on what the people really thought, and they'd get it, the police would have a basically non-political view. Clearly, there were political views, but that came after the residents had had their say. And the result was an outright rejection of this project. Now, the most condemnatory comment about using Hayes as the only police station in the whole borough was presented by a Labour supporter. And I'm sure he won't mind me naming him, but it was somebody we all know extremely well, and that is David Brough. And he was absolutely condemnatory that Hayes is not fit for the purpose for which the police want to do it. He's not a Conservative, and he wasn't supporting the Conservatives. He was saying what he believed, which was, this won't work. How are we going to cover the borough with a police station in Hayes when we know from the meetings we've had recently, and the Labour Party have been present at those, that there's going to be total gridlock when HS2 starts tunnelling in a few months' time? The North will be quite clearly cut off from the South, and we have total chaos. Now, I understand that the police have published some figures today that says the amount of savings they're going to make from this exercise is £450,000 to close Uxbridge. Now, it sounds like a lot of money to some. It's actually quite a small amount when it, co when it comes to uh, how, how you run a borough. Safety and crime is a perception. No evidence of the police. People assume that crime will rule and it's a danger for residents. A visible police station, people assume that pr crime is being controlled and they feel safer in their neighbourhoods. Clearly, we want a visible presence in the north of the borough and in Uxbridge. And I ask you all to support this motion. Thank you, Councillor Yarrow. Councillor Crow, you indicated. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It seems we are back to the MOFAC proposals. The location of all front desk activity at Hayes represents an inadequate location and provision for a borough the size and shape of Hillingdon. Uxbridge is a preference. The choice needs to be convenient for the public, and that should include Uxbridge and Ryslip. The report says that 8% of crime reports are at front counters, but it admits that 15% prefer contact in person. Front counters are important for confidence as well as reporting crime, bail and other purposes. The expensive estate can be trimmed as a source of capital receipts, but this need not reduce front desks in an arbitrary way. Buildings have security and receptions. They can be manned by volunteers, special constables or regular constables who, if demand is low, will at the same time be able to do other work, or at least I hope they will. This could happen at Ryslip. Already uh, volunteers run Ryslip. I hope they continue, although the MOPAC report actually says they, that they don't, says it's not manned at all. One problem is the failure to determine over a very long period, not one particular mayor, but a number of senior police officers, the clear model of policing and stick with it. I remember the opening of the police office at West Ryslip Station. Wasted. Closure was a quieter affair. Some of these proposals are contradictory closing a large number of small facilities and localising basing, but at the same time putting police into inadequate local positions where supervision and organisation 
will be actually very difficult. <coughs> the driving of force is to blame the government and maximise capital receipts. What is needed is retaining a station north of the A40. The criticism pays relative to Uxbridge remains. There is a need to reconsider and provide a permanent long-term pattern, preferably assessing costs and benefits, both monetary and social, in a properly quantified way, which I suspect has not been done in respect of this particular set of proposals. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Crow. Councillor Dillon. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councillor Crow talked some sense there. Um, I think at the end of the day, we're all on the same page. It's just uh, I think the political argument uh, gets in the way sometimes. Look, I'm a dad. I've got a 12-year-old kid. Um, every single day, you hear about a stabbing, a shooting, um, kids being drug pushers. Um, we're corporate parents. We should be protecting all the children that we have around our borough. Um, <coughs> Resources need to be diverted so that we can keep officers on the streets and they can be visible. So there needs to be visibility, as Councillor Yarrow indicated. People report crimes, whereas people on the beat, for me, tend to prevent crimes. Um, so where we have the stations or we don't have the stations, it doesn't matter to me. I want to keep officers on the ground looking out for our children, looking out for our residents. And that's what it should be about. The argument, we should be working together so that we have two uh, stations, if that's what's required, but not arguing about politics and politicising the whole issue, which I believe this motion does and which you feel our, motion, our amendment does. That's not the point of any of this. It's to have protection for our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dillon. Um, Councillor Mills, you reserved your right. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I said I welcomed the Labour amendment earlier on, and uh, we were quite right to, uh, having heard it, reject it. But I think I'm very pleased about it because it does distinguish the difference between us in terms of what we actually recognise. And, um, and forgive me if I, I missed it, and I throw the offer out again to Councillor Curlin and the Labour Group, can they confirm that they actually put a response in on behalf of the residents of this borough to the MOPAC Commission and will they publish it by 11 o'clock tonight? It will be electronic and what have you, shouldn't be too difficult. Or are they, or then I think the public will decide if they didn't, the chair, who, actually is, who actually is, is looking after the interests. Madam Mayor, what we've got to remember is that what we are trying to do is say to the Mayor of London, you are wrong on a borough like Hillingdon in reducing, closing Uxbridge, which you're still planning to do at the end of December. And he's doing it because he's told he's going to get a good financial gain for it. But no one has yet worked out what happens to the 200 officers currently working in Uxbridge uh, Police Station because Hayes is already at full capacity. How much more is it going to cost the Metropolitan Police Service on their day-to-day -day revenue costs to actually put these 200 officers somewhere else. They might get a capital gain, but they may actually lose out on the day-to-day. -day. So the whole plan seems to be very much not worked out. And our argument is, let's have a joined-up debate on behalf of the residents of Hillingdon. Because as a council, we are very sympathetic to the arguments that have been put to us by the Hayes Business uh, Partnership, that maybe what is required is keeping Uxbridge very much as the centre because it is our metropolitan town centre. It's everyone in the borough recognises Uxbridge, can get to Uxbridge and, and sees Uxbridge as a major place. But maybe what we need is, a, is some location down amongst the Hayes town centre rather than along the Uxbridge road where, again, policing can be seen because that's the other thing that comes through and my councillor, Councillor Yarrow, touched upon this. Policing is about a partnership it's a partnership not only with us as a council and we give additional funding to the local borough commander to make sure that we get good results. It's a partnership with our residents. If, they, if the Mayor of London, by taking a solution that might work in Camden but doesn't work in Hillingdon, 
starts to break that partnership between residents, council and the police, we start to go down a slippery slope. Our motion is stop. Let's have a rethink. Let's see what we can do. Don't blame the government. Face up to the reality that we've all had to face up to in public sector. There is less money. You've got to be wiser. You've got to be cleverer. We've done it in Hillingdon. Come and talk to us. We may be able to get a partnership working. Support the motion. The amendment shows Labour put residents last. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Riley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, if Labour colleagues want um, uh, to deal with uh, history as they've gone back in time, of course, let us not forget how we've got into uh, this mess. What was it? Good luck, all the money's gone. Was the uh, expression uh, left by the last Labour administration, and we're still living with how it was that Labour dealt with the economy. So the fact that there is uh, difficulty in public finances is something that we've had to recognise for many years and this administration, as I said earlier, has coped with it and delivered services at an extremely high level. That's what we're setting out as an example uh, to the Labour Mayor. Now, um, uh, Madam Mayor, we've said, uh, 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 Councillor Mills has said, uh, uh, about the uh, shape and size of the borough, we've got a population of 309,000 residents, 44 square miles in area and 20 kilometres in length. That's 12.4 miles in uh, old money for anyone who can't work it out, north to south. And so <clears throat> the problem that we raised in the public meeting and indeed uh, to the External Services Scrutiny Committee was detail. Uh, how was it that uh, officers were going to work in the north if they were having to come from Hayes? How was it that if officers were dropped off in one part of the north and something else happened in the other, how were they going to move around? All those sorts of details, and it had to be conceded by MOPAC and the borough commander that <coughs> there wasn't any detail. It hadn't been thought through, and that's what we're asking for, for a, for a, a, a rethink, for a, an attention to detail, which is what this administration does when examining uh, uh, cost and service, and that is why we've made this uh, uh, this motion, and that is why everyone in this chamber ought to support it. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Riley. Um, we will now vote on the original motion. Record, recorded, we're going to have a recorded vote. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, for the benefit of the members of the public present, a recorded vote has been asked for where, as opposed to a show of hands on the vote, each member is asked individually if they are voting for the motion as put forward by Councillor Riley on page 3 of the order paper, against or abstaining. Councillor Ahmad Wolana. For. Councillor Allen. Yes. Councillor Barnes. For. Councillor Bianco. For. Councillor Birra. Yes. Councillor Bridges. For. Councillor Burles. Councillor Chamdal, Four. Councillor Chapman, Four. Councillor G. Cooper, Four. Councillor J. Cooper, Four. Councillor Crow, Four. Councillor Curling, okay. Councillor Dan, Four. Councillor Davis, Four. Councillor Dennis, Four. Councillor Dillon, okay. Councillor Dot, okay. Councillor Deducci, okay. Councillor Duncan, okay. Councillor East, okay. Councillor Edwards, Councillor Edgington, okay. Councillor Flynn, Four. Councillor Fife, Four. Councillor Gardner, okay. Councillor Garg, okay. Councillor Gillam, Four. Councillor Hagger, Four. Councillor Hensley, Four. Councillor Higgins, Four. Councillor Jackson, Four. Councillor Kaufman, Four. Councillor Kelly, <coughs> Councillor Kashid, okay. Councillor Lachmana, okay. Councillor Lavery, Four. Councillor Lewis, Councillor Markham, Four. Councillor D. Mills, Four. Councillor R. Mills, Four. Councillor Money, Again. Councillor Morse, Again. Councillor Nelson, Again. Councillor O'Brien, Councillor Oswell, Four. Councillor Palmer, Four. Councillor Puddyfoot, Four. Councillor Riley, Four. Councillor Sansapuri, Four. Councillor Seaman Digby, Four. Councillor Simmons, Four. Councillor Singh, Again. Councillor Sweeting, Councillor White, Four. Councillor Yarrow, Four. Mr Deputy Mayor, Four. Madam Mayor. Four. Thank you Madam Mayor, that is carried by 38 votes to 20. So the motion is carried.
we will now move on to um, item 8.3, motion from Councillor Duncan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Housing benefit is for those qualifying residents who cannot afford full market rent based on their income. Encouragement is given to all who are able to work to do so and provide for themselves and their families as far as they are able. With this in mind, we have many residents who are seeking and returning to work so that they are less reliant on benefits and can increase their income. This is the theory, but in practice some very different things can happen. When someone starts work, they must inform the council that they are doing so and benefits can be adjusted. In practice, housing benefits stops completely and does not resume until new benefits, based on the new income and expenditure pattern, have been calculated. This is usually some weeks after the person has started work in order to get a clear picture of a consistent income. If the income of the person returning to work is large enough that no benefits are required, that is the end of the matter. If benefits are still required, however, because the person's income is insufficient, it can be a very different situation. I and other councillors have had cases where long delays have occurred, so long, in fact, that the person has given up work in the end and returned to living on benefits, which defeats the whole purpose driving these policies of encouraging people to return to work or continue working. I bring this motion to Council because I am asking for some changes to be made in delivery timescales of assessment for everyone, but particularly those returning to work who lose all their benefits until new assessments are made. Almost exactly a year ago, one young woman I know with three young children returned to work but received such a low income without benefits that she quickly fell into rent arrears and was threatened with eviction. She was told that no claim could be submitted for housing benefit until she had been working for a few weeks, so she was in arrears after the first month. When she was threatened with eviction, I accompanied her on the 5th of May this year when she submitted a new claim in order to try and move things along. We were assured that all documentation needed was in place. I stressed that she was being threatened with eviction and was told priority would be given to avoid eviction. Given this assurance, I spoke with her landlord and explained what was happening. Despite this, I still ended up accompanying her to court on the 31st of July, almost three months later, to ask for a stay of eviction while matters were sorted out. The stay was granted, but when we returned a few days later, the claim still had not been assessed. While waiting to go into court with her, I was told by phone her claim had been decided. With the agreement of the landlord, the case was adjourned. That afternoon, I received a message telling me that the assessment had been made, and not only was she now not in arrears, but was slightly in credit. By this time, of course, she was not working. The worry of being evicted with three young children meant that she was not sleeping, not eating, and sick with depression and fear for herself and her children and where they would go. She has still not returned to work. Thankfully, the new food bank in Newsley and West Drayton was open and able to provide food for her and her family for a few weeks, but it was a desperate situation, as I'm sure we can all appreciate. Throughout the whole process, there was no commitment to a time scale, although I was in communication with the service and letting them know what was happening. We knew very clearly when she was going to be evicted, we knew when court hearings were happening, but we never knew when her claim would be assessed properly and she would receive enough money to pay her rent and start paying her ever accruing arrears. I do not give this example to point the finger at anyone. I don't know why this happened, but it certainly illustrates very clearly the pressures on this service. I'm sure that the recent review of housing benefit undertaken by the Council may well have included some reference to these pressures. If not, perhaps further work needs to be done in this area. I want us to send out a clear message to all residents on benefits that if they wish to return to work, they can do so with confidence and know that if they still need and are entitled to some support in the form of housing benefit, that not only will they receive it, but when they will receive it. This way we will know how well the service is working and where it needs adjusting to support people into a good working life of their own. 
I ask Council to support this motion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Duncan. Is, is the motion seconded? Councillor Sansaperi. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm seconding this motion because we have had a number of cases where people returning to work do not earn enough to cover their living costs and still need housing benefit. The claim they make need to be dealt with speedily to enable them to continue working, otherwise they will fall into debt, which usually means rent errors happens. If the rent errors are not paid, then eviction will follow, and then they will be declared intentionally homeless. The situation is not very unusual. How quickly housing benefit can be assessed and paid to the people is therefore critical in them being able to continue working and living in their homes. We hear many times from the people who, had not, they, who have not had their assessment carried out or who are still waiting with no idea of when their claim will be determined or recalculated. People struggle to do what they can put, but in the, their, if, their, if their income is insufficient, they will fail into areas through no fault of their own and be faced with evictions and homelessness. We are asking that more certainty is put into the system so the people will know when their claim will be determined. Sometimes not all matters are taken into account. For example, residents have been told us that they have submitted the birth certificate of the children several times and still they have not been taken into account when assessment is made. We know that calculating benefit is very complex matter and requires detailed training and regular updating. It is important that we recognize this so that the serving service Wellington provides is very best it can be and will residents move from benefit to work without risk, risk of losing their home. To assist this, we ask that changes are made to enable the service to be very thorough and time critical when responding to resident claims. I support, I sorry, I second this motion. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Councillor Sanzaferi. Councillor Bridges, you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. As members will recall, Cabinet was recently presented with the findings of the Policy Overview Committee's review into the impact of changes to housing benefits on residents. In its report, the Committee concluded that it was satisfied with the changes mandated by national legislation uh, being implemented correctly and that the Council is doing all that it can to support residents throughout these changes. For the benefit of those who are not aware, housing benefit is a Department for Work and Pensions benefit administered by the local authority. It is a means-tested benefit to assist residents on a low income with their rent. In terms of Hillingdon, the Council's Housing Benefits Service currently has over 23,000 live claims and processes around 500 new claims each month. This service already sets and reviews delivery timescales annually for processing housing benefit and Council tax reduction applications. The Housing Benefit uh, Service delivery timescale for new claims in 2017-2018 is 30 days and performance to date is 26.5 days. For claims where this is a uh, change in circumstances, the target is 10 days and performance is 8.6 days. These timescales begin from the date of application and run through to the date of benefit calculation. This captures the time it has taken the resident to provide the information required to process their claim, all of which are in accordance with the benefit regulations that clearly state that the resident has to be given one month or more to supply the information to support their claim. These measures reflect how the Department for Work and Pensions uh, measures local authority performance on a national basis and is one of their key performance indicators. The Department for Work and Pensions do not have a key performance target in place to measure the time taken to calculate a claim from the date of the last information or to the point at which all document documentation is in place. However, the service does record turnaround time, which for new claims is currently an average of 8.9 days. The POC review also confirmed that the restructuring of the housing department has recently taken place and that this has resulted in no reduction in staffing. Instead, this restructuring has regraded certain management roles in order to attract greater expertise and skills from the marketplace. In addition to this, a subject matter expert will now be placed within each team to support casework and ensure consistency and standards. The Cabinet has also committed to continue to resource the area and the department is actively recruiting four senior roles. 
In summary, the Council already monitors key targets and exceeds national guidelines. However, the Council is not being complacent. It is maintaining funding and putting in extra resources and expertise to further improve the service. And for those reasons, good resourcing of the service, excellent and skilled and professional staff, and the continuing programme to improve the service, that I oppose this motion. Thank you, Councillor Bridges. Are there any more speakers? No. Councillor Duncan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm sorry that the other side um, doesn't see fit to support this. Um, it may say 30 days um, in the DWP targets. I've just given an example of when I personally came in with somebody uh, on the 5th of May uh, and was assured that all the documentation was in place so that we knew you know, that, that the claim could be assessed and yet still by the 31st of July it had not been made. Although this is a system that we administer for the DWP, if evictions take place, and they do take place, um, then very often that uh, falls on this council to deal with that fallout of what has happened with that system not being timely enough to prevent evictions because if children are involved we then have to um, have a housing duty towards them, place them in bed and breakfast, there are high costs for that and so it involves greater costs to this council quite apart from human and personal um, suffering um, and really we want to give dignity back to people, people who do want to work and provide uh, for their families but do need this support in the interim. That's why I'm bringing it. I had hoped that the other side would um, be cooperative about this. Um, I do know that some of their councillors also know about this situation. Um, I'm not standing here telling untruths about it. They too know that these things exist, as do councillors on, on my own side too. Um, so I'm sorry this happens. We will continue to help people, obviously. And, um, and I hope the other side will too. But it's, it's a sadness to me that it's still going to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duncan. We now go to a, a vote on the motion. All those for the motion? Thank you. All those against? Thank you. The motion is lost. Back to 8.2 on the agenda. A motion from Councillor Mills. Madam Mayor, if, just before Councillor Mills speaks, members may note uh, the uh, section in italics after the motion which Councillor Mills is going to ask for an alteration. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, under procedural rules 14.7, I would like the meeting's consent to make an alteration to the motion by inserting the words where appropriate in the fifth paragraph as shown on the green paper. Everybody in agreement? Thank you. Karen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, in moving this motion, it's an, to enable us to give a response to the Boundary Commission before their deadline of the 11th of December about their latest proposals for parliamentary constituencies. Um, there has been a, a, a process in place, and what's, what concerns us is that so far they seem to be ignoring the wishes of a large number of people that responded to the initial consultation, including two residents' associations, the South Ryslip Residents' Association and the Ryslip Gardens Resident Association. All these people, both individuals and, and these bodies, made a very strong point that the two Norfolk wards from Ealing have no affiliation, no close connections with parts of South Ryslip or indeed uh, parts of uh, the, the wider Uxbridge Hillingdon area. Uh, in addition, the representations made at the last consultation were about the opportunity of bringing together a lot of the rice-lit wards that have been split apart from previous um, work by commissions of, of previous years, and again that seems to be ignored, although the Commission on reading their documentation seem to have picked up on individual uh, responses that seem to be almost not based in fact, and we feel that we need to sort of try and highlight that these particular points. Another unfortunate aspect that appears to have happened following the, the Commission's work to date is that having recognised that Ickenham really is a parish of Uxbridge 
and again from previous, uh, uh, previous works got shifted north into the, the right at Northwood Pinner constituency maybe should belong back to Uxbridge has again been shifted north again and we wish to take the opportunity of pointing out to the Boundary Commission that one of the laws of unintended consequences of what they are proposing by including the two North Holts is actually moving Ickenham back north when they actually originally were thinking of moving it back into the Uxbridge constituency. So this motion uh, gives the authority on the leader of the council and the head of democratic services to make a formal response and to suggest uh, amendments to boundaries that would actually meet the criteria set out by the Boundary Commission. Equally, um, we already share, as everyone knows, uh, in the north of the borough a boundary with Harrow to form a parliamentary constituency and it would seem logical that if there has to be uh, a further stretching of walls beyond Hillingdon then maybe going further into Harrow is a more logical step than opening up a, dare I say, a new front uh, with another borough uh, which, uh, whilst it would be possible, will actually create more logistical problems and practical issues in terms of uh, running elections uh, when they come. Especially as the next general election date does, as it stands at the moment, coincide with the date of the next borough election. And I think that's an important point that people need to be taking into account. Residents will be going in and being bombarded with num numerous ballot papers, <coughs> some of which will, of course, will be Hillingdon alone, some could be Hillingdon and Harrow, and so as some of the proposals, Hillingdon and Ealing parts. And uh, whilst we all understand and, and follow every nth degree of, of all these things, most residents just go in there and want a simple bit of paper and knowing who they're voting for. They recognise and understand where their borough boundaries are and I think that we need to make a representation again to the Boundary Commission that they need to think before they make their final decision as to whether exploring into Ealing is really in our interest. Uh, we fear not. Thank you, Councillor Mills. Do we have a second? Councillor Lavery. Uh, Madam Mayor, I, I second and formally reserve my right. Thank you. Councillor Edgington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to propose an amendment to the motion. The amendment is as printed on the order paper, but essentially it amends the motion so it will then read that Council notes the publication by the Boundary Commission for consultation purposes of the proposed new parliamentary constituencies for England. Council authorises the Head of Democratic Services in conjunction with the Leader of the Council to respond by confirming Council's agreement to the proposals. We've been here before, haven't we, Madam Mayor? You'll recall that a year ago, 364 days ago, actually, you voted in favour of another motion, also related to the Boundary Commission. And in that motion, there was reference to one of the key principles of the Boundary Commission, which is continuity. That motion, which you and a large number of members here voted for, stated that it would be more sensible not to move any of the, or to move fewer of the Hillingdon wards between constituencies, to reduce the number of wards being moved from five to three. That's what was in the motion. That was what was sent to the Boundary Commission. Well, the Boundary Commission have not taken on board everything which was proposed, but they have taken on board that. And indeed, they've made the most extreme position possible by proposing that only one ward will move between constituencies. Just one. So I would have thought that, based on that, the councillors who voted a year ago would be delighted seems eminently sensible. Just usually would have moved from Hazen, would, as is being proposed to move from Hazen Harlington to the new Hillingdon and Uxbridge constituency. It reminds me of a kind of situation of a child, a sport child, who pesters his parents or her parents for a balloon. And then when they get that balloon, they find it's the wrong colour. In fact, in this case, it's red and not blue and the child gets very upset as a result <laughs> Madam Mayor I would ask all members here to support this amendment
Do we have a seconder? Oh, uh, Councillor Moore. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Mayor, I'll, I'll second this. And um, um, the proposed, the original proposals from the Conservative group actually was all total a sort of gerrymandering sort of uh, constituency, and I particularly remember that little bit of North Arrow, which. Uh, was sticking up, up and was a totally inappropriate thing. So I would actually think that, what, as, as, as Councillor Egerton has just said, that um, what we've been offered it seems a perfectly reasonable one. Therefore, we are in second in this motion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Uh, Madam Mayor, can I just confirm we have a m an amendment moved and seconded, and it is as printed in italics on page six. We're now debating that. Do we have Councillor Council Mills gets a right of reply to move the original motion now after yes. if anybody else wishes to speak? Anybody else wishes to speak? Uh, 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 thank you, Madam Mayor. I think the Labour Party have failed to demonstrate any understanding about actually supporting <laughs> about about actually about actually supporting what our residents are trying to, to say. And when when there are a large number of residents across the across the borough submitting proposals to the Boundary Commission that are saying you ha there is no evidence that Ealing is should, the two Norfolk wards should be part of uh, a wider constituency. I think it's per perfectly reasonable for us as the local authority. And again, maybe this is the difference between the way in which we actually listen to residents and try to support our residents and how the Labour Party are maybe sitting there with their calculators trying to work out, oh no, we won't support that because that's not in our interest. We, we, however, want to support those residents and you cannot deny that when two resident groups in the South Ricep area are saying to the Boundary Commission, please listen to us, it is not unreasonable for the local authority in the, the, the body that we are to say to the Boundary Commission, you cannot just simply dismiss their arguments because they represent hundreds of local residents they, otherwise, what is the point of having residence associations? And I think it is very reasonable of, of our motion to want to try and emphasise that point. The Labour motion, clear, Labour amendment is clearly just trying to kill this and try to get through what they believe might work for their benefit, whilst we, once again, are trying to listen to residents, work with <laughs> residents and actually convey residents. Look, uh, I don't know how many of you have actually read the Boundary Commission submissions. But you cannot deny that there are a large number of people, both who are arguing for the Ricelip wards to be brought together and for South Ricelip to be not part of Norfolk. Maybe you haven't looked at the Boundary Commission website. I suggest you go on it. You may be surprised as to how many people have actually made a submission. But then again, we listen to residents. You don't. That is the clear message that's coming through tonight. I, I suggest we vote against their amendment. Po point of order... Councillor Curling, I actually asked Councillor Mills to speak through the chair. Councillor Edgington. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. It still goes back to the fact, Madam Mayor, that we had a motion a year ago and effectively a large number of members here, I expect, will be supporting a motion which is contrary to what was su su submitted a, a, a year ago. Um, for example, we talk about Ricelift being some sort of entity which is important. Well, I think the submission a year ago split Ricelift anyway. There are five Ricelift wards, according to my calculations, and last time council suggested that four would be in one constituency and one would be in the other. Well, now apparently that's all different and maybe all five or maybe we're going to perm any four from five in terms of the submission. The problem I have with the submission, which uh, the, the idea that it's going to be down to the head of democratic services and the leader is that we've got no idea what, this, what these arrangements are going to be in other way could be anything. It could include part of Ealing, it could include part of Hounslow, I've no idea. It's saying nothing at all in the motion and that's why we believe that it's important 
that we accept the Boundary Commission proposals because they do make a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Edgington. We are now voting on the amendment. Those for the amendment, please. Thank you. Those against? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That amendment uh, falls, and we are back to debating the original motion as submitted by Councillor Mills. I uh, don't have any other speakers other than Councillor Lavery who reserved his right, and obviously Councillor Mills who has the right yes. to reply. Mm. Councillor Lavery. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I, I shall be brief. Uh, the current Boundary Commission proposals represent a partial improvement on their first efforts, but they still don't recognise the historic connections between communities. They still add in to Northolt wards which have no connection with Hillingdon and Uxbridge. And if a way can be found that accommodates the wishes of residents and also creates two wards that are exclusively within Hillingdon, that clearly would make more sense. It, it's much easier to understand and much easier to follow. And all this motion is asking for is an opportunity for this council to express that view and to ask the Boundary Commission to take another look at their proposals. And for that reason, I have supported the motion. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Lavery. <laughs> Councillor Mills, please. Very briefly, Madam Mayor, I think it is very clear, and as Councillor Lavery has, has perfectly summed up what we're trying to do, and I think it's very reasonable. And Madam Mayor, I think it is important that we do support residents on a number of issues, and this, is, this, this one is no different. Can I just correct something that I may have said, which may have confused even myself at times? Um, the, when I, I think I said next elections, I've almost probably, next, next year's elections probably already out of my mind. The 2022 <laughs> election potentially is a borough council election the same date as the general election. I knew what I meant. <laughs> can, can we now vote on the motion, please? Those four are. Oh. Okay. We've been asked for a recorded vote. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We're having a recorded vote on this motion. Please, the members indicate if they're voting for the original motion as moved by Councillor Douglas Mills, against or abstain. Councillor Ahmad Wulana. For. Councillor Allen. Against. Councillor Barnes. For. Councillor Bianco. For. Councillor Birra. Yes. Councillor Bridges. For. Councillor Burles. Yes. Councillor Chamdow. Councillor Chapman, Councillor G. Cooper, Councillor J. Cooper, Councillor Crow, Councillor Curling, Councillor Dan, Councillor Davis, Councillor Dennis, Councillor Dillon, Councillor Dot, Councillor Duduchu, Councillor Duncan, Councillor East, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Edgington, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Fife, Councillor Gardner, Councillor Garg, Councillor Gillam, Councillor Hagger, Councillor Hensley, Councillor Higgins, Councillor Jackson, Councillor Kaufman, Councillor Kelly, Councillor Kashid, Councillor Lachmana, Councillor Lavery, Councillor Lewis, Councillor Markham, Councillor D. Mills, Councillor R. Mills, Councillor Money, Councillor Morse, Against. Councillor Nelson, Against. Councillor O'Brien, Councillor Oswell, Aye. Councillor Palmer, Aye. Councillor Puddyfoot, Aye. Councillor Riley, Aye. Councillor Sansapuri, Aye. Councillor Seaman Digby, Aye. Councillor Simmons, Aye. Councillor Singh, Aye. Councillor Sweeting, Aye. Councillor White, Aye. Councillor Yarrow, Aye. Mr Deputy Mayor, Aye. Madam Mayor. Aye. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The motion is carried by 38 votes to 20. We move on now to um, 8.4 in the agenda. Motion from Councillor Morse. Thank you, Madam Mayor. In April two, uh, 2011, the Ministry of Defence commissioned a report called Project NOAA for an asset review of RAF Norfolk. The, re the report, re renamed ARC, concluded that safety defects of the aerodrome 
that it was impossible to license the airport for commercial flights under CAA rules. In 2014, a judicial review was undertaken for Oxford and Biggin Hill airports concerning the legality of civilian aircraft movements being managed by the MAA, which is the military uh, part of the RAF. The judge ruled that the CAA and the Secretary of State for Transport are responsible for the safety of all civilian flights using RAF Northolt and other military aerodromes in the UK. So there was a significant change. In 2015, this article, which has actually never been published completely, was, was actually exposed. It was done by a company called Mott MacDonald, the professionals at building airfields. The report stated that while some changes could be made, the airport would struggle to meet CAA standards for civilian flights. The report highlighted roads close to the runway thresholds, end safety areas and more than 300 obstacles that breached the obstacle limitation surface, which is a technical issue with airports. These include the roof of a petrol filling station 105 metres from the end of the runway, which rises over 4.5 metres into protected airspace, 11 res residential houses, a block of flats and lamp posts and trees. So many of these obstacles have no obstacle lighting. And also, the MAA actually asked for a number of, I've got FOIs on that, which they've actually a number of areas of safety which they've got exclusions on, which, which included particularly lighting. The report also confirmed that even if the runways reduce to 1354 metres, it could carry all turbojets up to 70 seats and four types of jet that carry 100 passengers. This is a professional company with a good reputation. In the avian industry, this is a serious proposal. When questioned on September 3rd, Harry Baldwin confirmed that the MOD has not obtained independent legal advice to confirm the legality of increasing commercial flights at Northolt. The Minister also stated that medium-sized jets can operate at Northolt and that the current planning regulations project both, protect both larger aircraft and those on the ground. The MOD has sanctioned the increase in flights without any environmental proposals that should be and should be implemented in the full environmental impact assessment. On the 13th of se September, Tobias Elwood said, I am willing to meet with, with councillors and other residents. I very much to share the information we have. Now this was referring to Harrow councillors, because no one here has actually bothered to find anything about what he's developing. Oh. I therefore conclude that all the suggestions incorporated in my motion would rece receive the support of the Minister himself. Harriet Baldwin puts great emphasis that no scheduled flights are allowed. This is irrelevant as most air airlines are reducing first-class travel and the private charter business is booming, financed by the super-rich. By restricting the, aer the, aerodrome, uh, the, the aerodrome to charter flights, we are following the business model advocated in the Arthur Court. So this is actually follows what was suggested, the best way the MOD can extract the most income from this type. And the proposal was then to go on further and actually the RF uh, leases the land to a private company who then, the next proposed stage of the proposals was actually to go up to 50,000 flights. Now, I did not write, I did not write, uh, write this report. I then got to a situation where people asked me questions and I felt they should be put before council for discussion. I, so in summary, what has the Council done to monitor developments in Northolt? What research has been done to vary all this prospective development at Northolt is impossible. I submit this motion as the first step to protect our residents and the aircraft crash just and Peru. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Morse. Um, seconded, Councillor Curley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I second this motion in the hope that it receives all party support. Airport expansion is not a new topic for debate in this chamber. We have a proud record of 100% unity against any further expansion of Heathrow, and I believe that that should be extended to unity against any further development of civil flights from the RAF Northolt site. My personal view has always been, and still remains, that there is no need for any expansion of airports in the southeast of England. Indeed, I believe that there is already far too much traffic in the skies above us in this area, which is one of the most congested areas 
of airspace in the world and we should not be adding to it. In my opinion, the party opposite have taken a couple of strange tactical moves in recent years, first by promoting a garden city should Heathrow ever close, then by accepting a new runway is needed and that it should be at Gatwick. All the arguments against expansion of Heathrow can also apply to expansion of civil flights from Northolt, especially the environmental impact being that the airbase is already in an area of poor air quality. You can go onto the uh, website of the London City Airport right now, and uh, perhaps this is a, a website that Councillor Mills might want to check out, um, because you can book a seat on an executive jet flying out of Northolt. Um, so it, it's already operating um, as a civil aviation uh, hub. Um, I'm sure that many people would be aware, aware that uh, RAF Northolt has many military strategic functions and is an important part of our defences. And indeed, it is an airbase that is very much needed and welcome in our borough as a military airfield. But the use of it as a mini civil airport is somewhat less desirable. I would urge the leader and his administration to at least listen to the concerns of the residents around Northolt and vote in favour of this motion. After all, a previous Conservative leader of Hillingdon, Andrew Boff, now a GLA member, recently moved a similar motion at City Hall. So uh, that's um, where I stand on this matter. And Councillor Mills has spent um, the, the whole evening saying how the administration listen to the residents of this borough um, uh, it doesn't seem like he's listening to many that I listen to but this is, this is a chance for Councillor Mills and others on the other side to demonstrate that they are willing to listen to the residents of this borough thank you Madam Mayor Thank you Councillor Curley Councillor Hensley please Many thanks, uh, Madam Mayor, and I'm very privileged to be able to speak tonight on behalf of the residents of Ickenham because they are also affected by the flights from Northolt. Also in our presence tonight we have two squadron leaders. One is responsible for the communication of information from the MOD to the residents and the other one is responsible for operational flights out of Northolt. And I'll, I'll read out exactly what went in Ickenham calling in summer 2017 to the residents of Ickenham. Runway works to start in June 2018 to December. These are to repair the runway and to improve the arrest of beds to prevent aircraft overshooting onto the A40. These have been promised for some time but the MOD has finally released the necessary monies. This work is to prolong the life of the, air, of the airfield for another 15 years. It's the centre part of the runway that is being damaged and that part is going to be uh, repaired or uh, completely rebuilt and the whole runway resurfaced. Possible scheduled service. This has been floating around for some time. Realistically, with the air base operating as it does now, there is no way a scheduled service could operate out of Northolt. The number of movements and type of aircraft are strictly limited. The maximum number of movements per year is 12,000. A movement is a landing or takeoff. These can only operate between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Monday to Friday and 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Saturday and Sunday. The maximum number of movements per day is 40. Aircraft have a maximum capacity of 29 passengers and no more. There's no, there's no room to lengthen the runway because of West End Road and the A40. During the shutdown period, the, 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 the 146s will be flying out of RAF Benson that's between June and December. Helicopter flights will still be going into Northolt. Commercial airlines are not permitted to use Northolt unless, exceptionally, there's a May Day. And I, I've been assured by the RAF that air movements are paramount and private jets will be di diverted even in the air if, R, uh, if RAF requirements are required. For, for me, as long as RAF Northolt remains, we have a secure air cover over London. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Thank you, Councillor Hensley. Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I wasn't going to, in those immortal words, I wasn't actually going to speak tonight, but I thought I'd better. In, in the Westminster Hall debate on the future of RAF's North Holt on the 13th of September, the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Defence, Tobias Elwood, said, and I will read it out. Flyby made an unsolicited bid in 2015. No meetings about RAF Northolt have been held with any commercial airline, but in late 2015 and early 2016, ministers corresponded twice with the chief executive of Flyby to inform him that his bid was not being considered further. He went on to say, the, surface, the, runway, the runway resurfacing project at RAF Northolt aims to make improvements as required to upgrade existing military and safety features and extend the main runway pavement to between 10 and 15 years. This planned life cycle replacement work in line with the safety cases for the military aircraft that operate from the station. I repeat firmly that the aim is not to accept bigger commercial aircraft, but to ensure that the runway has the strength to accept the larger military aircraft that may be required to visit the station in future. Alongside the BAE 146 military airframes based there, a number of European allies operate medium airliner-sized military aircraft into Northolt on military business. The RF C-17s and A400M Atlas are the largest type of aircraft that visit the station. He concluded his long speech by saying, uh, which you'll be pleased to hear, I won't be reading out the whole his whole text, that RF Northolt remains a core station with many diverse units. The aerodrome is needed by the military every day and is valuable, valuable for contingency, as we saw in the Olympics and the Ebola outbreak. The decision for its future was taken in 2013 and we will not revisit that decision. After the military runway works are complete and the runway reopens, nothing will have changed. The same stringent terms and conditions on civil movements that have been in place for many years and were reaffirmed in 2013 will, be, will remain in place. The military and civil aviation authorities will continue to employ robust oversight and assurance of civil aviation activity. Madam Mayor, this is an ill-conceived motion that is merely on the order paper to needlessly worry the residents who live around North Old Aerodrome. Here, here and to raise pop a popular cause that has no basis in truth. Accordingly, we will be voting against this motion. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Lewis. Councillor Crowe, you indicated. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <coughs> Councillor Moore said that nobody had taken the trouble to find out about this. Well, I have. <laughs> I've been on that runway twice. Once to take my first passenger flight in the de Havilland Rapide biplane decades ago and once in the last couple of days to take a good look at it. It needs refurbishing, not lengthening, refurbishing. It is currently safe. It has, I understand, passed recent civil and military inspection. It is a safe operating environment, operating on the same basis and systems as civilian airports. They now have the opportunity to bring the latest technology to arrest the beds and runway lighting. Various interests would gain by restricting or ending North Holt's activities. That includes some councils and other airfields. We also have impending local elections. A campaign sustained by modern techniques despite repeated assurances about the future is underway and I am intrigued as to its origins. The ARC report, April 2013, government's decision, retain a military aerodrome with a 12,000 cap on business aviation movements. The report was then archived. I, like Councillor Hensley, have seen the severely limited civilian facilities. Scheduled services seem to me to be impossible. North Holt is a significant strategic asset and the services will not risk it. It holds 15 RAF units, including 32, 600 and 601 squadrons. Navy and Army units, the London Air Ambulance, Government and Allied Forces elements. 
It's important for emergency contingency operations, including anti-terrorism and ordnance disposal. 2012 Olympics, it hosted typhoons. It's the closest to London able to serve this purpose. Government agencies will not risk or impede this capacity and flexibility. Normal services, normal services, will return from December 2018 and I see no reason not to believe the, insurance, the assurances not to do more. The suggestion to reduce movements to 5,000 implies the airfield is safe. If the opposition is really concerned about environmental issues, concentrate on HS2 and the third yeah, runway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Clough. Councillor Puddyford. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Morse's motion refers to the conflicting reports about the potential to develop Northall, the conflict being between the statement made on behalf of the MOD by the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Defence in September, which is published in full in this rather good edition of November, December edition of Opinion of People, and the rumours from the yet unattributable Stop Northall campaign to which I referred earlier. Uh, local residents have Due to this campaign, raised concerns with the Council regarding speculation that planned runway improvements in 2018 were to enable the airport to receive passenger commercial planes. Speaking at Westminster Hall debate on Wednesday the 13th of September, we've heard some of this but not all, the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Defence, Tobias Elwood MP, put an end to the rumours, stating it is not just an aerodrome but a vibrant core military station with over 1,800 personnel based across 33 diverse units from all three of the armed services and wider government. I turn to the aerodrome itself. It is used and needed by the military every single day. It is true that for a number of decades it had been underutilised in that role. Since the 1980s, RAF Northolt has accepted up to 7,000 business aviation movements per year, but that was done under stringent terms and conditions to utilise the spare capacity. For that very reason, from 2011 to 2013, we conducted an extensive value for money evaluation of RAF Northolt's future utilisation. Wide ranging options were considered, including selling the aerodrome off as a civilian licensed airport, devising shared civilian and military usage to better maximise revenue, and retaining the aerodrome in military hands, although that would leave an irreducible spare capacity. I impress on the Chamber that those were simply options that were considered. While the review was going on in 2012, the Ministry of Defence commissioned a series of reports under Project Ark and Project NOAA. Those reports were to analyse the various available options. Further consideration was given to one Project Ark option that had the potential to increase civil use of the military aerodrome to up to 20,000 movements to generate additional revenue from the underutilised spare capacity. However, Ministers took the final decision to increase the self-imposed cap on civil movements to only 12,000 movements per year. That was implemented in April 2013. There are no plans to revisit that decision. There are no plans to revisit that decision. I assure residents of the area that no current active planning is looking at any further changes to that 2013 decision about the cap or the operating terms and conditions. The unchanged stringent terms and conditions that have been in place for civil movements for many years mean that, the, in, that in future we will not attract any aircraft larger than those that we've accepted for decades. They are civil aircraft, I'm not talking about large military aircraft. The Labour Group may have their own reason to try to undermine the future of RAF Northolt, but we will not support them. It is an integral part of our community, as are the service personnel Council that serve there, and they have our full support. Come to the conclusion. <laughs> Councillor Simmons. Well, Madam Mayor, in the interest of transparency, I should probably declare that I am one of the residents who is very directly affected by RAF Northolt. Indeed, um, one of my young son's first words was airplane, prompted by the sight of the aircraft flying very, very low uh, over our home, as they do on a regular basis. But Northolt, in my view, and in the view of, I think, many of my neighbours, has been to us a good neighbour over the years. Um, it is an airport which seeks to manage its relationships and certainly the feedback from the excellent residents associations that look after the residents around the airport, North Uxbridge Residents Association, Nickenham Residents Association, South Rysett Residents Association, is that there has been over many years good engagement and a good reason to trust those in the Royal Air Force 
when they give us these assurances. Now, I think we probably are all a little bit cynical when we hear politicians talk about there being no plans for things. We remember Tony Blair going on the television just before the 97 election saying, I have no plans to raise tax at all. Um, that turned out a little bit differently. So I think it is right that we are cynical and questioning and seek to make sure that what is coming forward genuinely reflects the assurances that have been given and genuinely reflects the concerns that our residents have. But of course, we do need to ask that key question which Councillor Crow began to address. Who benefits from the lies that are being told to our residents about what may happen in the future at Northolt? Well, we know that those behind the expansion of Heathrow would need to see the closure of Northolt in order to occupy the airspace. So there clearly are commercial interests who would like to see a campaign of this nature <laughs> succeed. But we are going into local elections, and there is a little part of me that thinks as we come into the spring and we begin our real process of in-depth campaigning that we need to ensure that the proposals put forward by our neighbours in Ealing are brought to the attention of residents affected. Because the Easter Bunny is not going to be bringing a nice chocolate egg. Labour's Easter Bunny is going to be bringing 20,000 additional homes on that site. And I have to say, as one of those people directly affected, a good neighbour in RAF Northolt, or the traffic gridlock, the pollution, that 20,000 extra homes worth of traffic movements would bring to our borough, I think that's a very clear choice that we would make in that political circumstance. So I think people need to know that that is what is on the table from the party opposite and that we are enjoying, as we currently do, a good relationship with Northolt, who have been a good neighbour over the years and are an asset to this borough as they are an asset to this country. Thank you to Councillor Simmons. Are there any other? Yeah. Councillor Yarrow. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I hope I'm the last, uh, the last one as the time is running late. Um, I can't really figure out why this is actually on the agenda tonight. Enough information is known about what uh, REF Northolt is doing. It's clearly in the, uh, in the Lingdon people. It's been known for a long time. There is no intention to let fly be jets uh, land there. It's, it's, it, the jets that are landing there are needed to supplement the funding in order to keep it as a viable station. Now I have to say that when I was, there are dark forces around here that are planning things. When I was mayor of this council in 2010, the mayor of Bromley took keen delight every time we met, that before he'd had the first swig of his glass of champagne, to say that the Royal Flight was leaving Oaks Oaksbridge, it was leaving RAF North Oak, it was going to Biggin Hill. They were going to have it at all costs. Well, it's still here because they haven't got it and we intend to and wish to keep it and wish to keep REF North Oak. Can I just read you a statement from Oaksbridge North Residents Association which said, the residents of North Oaksbridge are no strangers to overflying from North Oak, but against this we balance the importance of the base both locally and to the nation. We are proud of RAF Northolt, as we are of the Battle of Britain bunker in Uxbridge. It is sensible to permit commercial flying to generate income in the downtime between flights for military and government purposes. The limits on commercial flying are sensible, and we accept the assurances from the Ministry of Defence that they will not be exceeded. So not everybody is against RAF Northolt. Another dark force that has presented itself is Ealing Council, Ealing Labour Council, who have suggested, as, as uh, Councillor Simmons said, that it would be a good place to build 20,000 homes. Well, fine, but yes, you could build 20,000 homes. Uh, housing is not an issue of this. It's, primarily it's a vital <laughs> issue of this. You are actually bringing it into the subject. Councillor Moore. Councillor Moore. Councillor Moore. It is not a point of order. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Never mind the traffic chaos that will occur in Hillingdon and the new schools and medical facilities that will be needed to service 20,000 houses. Then we have the so-called Stop Northolt campaign, of which we don't know who it is, where it is, or how much money has been put into it. All I can say is, just to lighten the evening a little bit, with all these dark forces about, I feel like Harry Potter confronting Lord Voldemort 
So to these proposals I say expelliarmus and I shall be voting against the vote. Thank you, Councillor Yarrick. Councillor Kaufman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I wasn't going to speak tonight, but um, everyone in the world has spoken about RAF Northolt, and as it happens to be in my ward, I am very proud of RAF Northolt, and it plays a very important part in the life of the community of South Ryslip, and long may it continue. I'm totally against this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kaufman. Councillor Allen. Madam Mayor, I wasn't proposing to speak tonight neither. Unlike, you know, knowing there's an election next year, I also am not against Northolt Airport as it is for our services, our vital services. We've all got friends, family, loved ones who've been there, done that and got the T-shirt. But I think half of the problem is is the silence of this council. We had to wait. Councillor I mean, Allen, please, you. through Councilor the chair. was waving this around in the air. Why did it take till today for this to be anywhere? Was it electioneering? Yes. So let's stop the grandstanding. We're opposed to the uh, Heathrow Airport. We're opposed to any expansion of Northolt Airport. Let's be clear. Thank you. Madam Mayor, just on a, a point of clarification, the statement was made on the 13th of September that appears in here. If you get the earlier edition, you will see that I refer to the scaremongering of the Stop Northolt campaign, I think in the July edition. But at that time, we didn't have the statement from the Minister. We knew it was scaremongering. We wanted to put out uh, the residence. Could we you want... please speak to the Mayor? I, yes. I, I, I will speak to the Mayor. You know, <laughs> Councillor, <laughs> there has been we, 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 we knew you. it was scaremongering. We wanted a statement from the Ministry of Defence. We asked for it. We got it. We published it. End of story. <laughs> Thank you. No other speak speakers. Councillor Morse. It was semi-logical until we got to the point about putting, about putting property on there. We have no intentions of any property development. This is purely a safety issue. We are not proposing to close the RAF, but there is a number of features of the report which is still not explained. Any person who sees where the roads are and what the issues are with a problem with the plane taking off or landing understands why the airport is in a difficult position. It's as simple as that's a safety issue. Uh, if we look at what the MOD are now proposing, they are proposing to buy £45 million when the number of flights there is actually dropping, has been dropping for a number of years. And 70% is commercial flights, which is not commercial flights. In a, it's not a schedule, it's actually these companies running their, their, their things. What is different about RAF? It has to have a rest of it because of these safety <coughs> issues. As far as I know, no other... RAF base as the rest of it. And this is actually there for the safety of the commercial movement. So then we have the issue of what are we funding when this development takes place? And this has been a number of the points that have been raised by an MP in Parliament. So it's, it's a safety issue on the base, which I think has not been resolved. And I'll give an example. 31 airports in the UK now have personal safety loans. This is a more advanced of personal safety based on statistics of where planes fall when, when there's issues. Because when an event occurs, you cannot be certain what, when it will be. There could be, even though, it would, you know, it, they, they do calculations on the basis of a million landings. Yeah? Now, what I don't understand here is this is not any attempt to remove the RF, not support the RF, it's actually to try and make this place safe and to have a continuation of the RF. What, what the problem is, the ability of the RF uh, personnel will be higher than the commercial pilots. And we have another issue. The legal, legal judgment was that this has to meet the CAA mission. It, RAF Norfolk, the pilot on the commercial self-certificates, he says, I can fly there. This is completely different to any other uh, civilian airline airport in the country. And all we're raising here is the issues 
that this is a safety issue, nothing to do with the issues raised. And it's a little bit sad, and it was going reasonably well to the end, when <laughs> well, unfortunately you got to the point where we started talking about what well, we're not intentions. Um, and what we have is a number of residents who've raised this as an issue and just said, not interested. All we're asking is that this is considered carefully and looked at what their concerns are and what the environment is increasing this. Because as I said in the opening point, it's not even clear whether the ROD... Come to really a conclusion, will. please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. We now come to a vote on the motion. All those for the motion, please. All those against the motion. That motion is lost. Thank you. As we come to the end of the business, I declare the meeting closed.